Thank you, Shivana, for your beautiful introduction and for inviting us to participate in this splendid program. Let me tell you just a little bit about our project now. William Bartram, who is the focus of the work that Teresa and I are now engaged in together, um, was a North American naturalist artist of English descent and Quaker faith, who was unusually open to multiple vantage points on the natural world. During his long career, which spanned from the colonial period through the first decades of the New Republic, Bartram was deeply engaged in the European Enlightenment endeavor to classify the world's natural productions. But he also developed an interest in the interactions that he observed among plants and animals in his family's renowned botanic garden on the Schuylkill River in the vicinity of Philadelphia and on his extensive travels across the Eastern seaboard. Bartram's spiritually charged protopantheistic understanding of nature as an intricate web of environmental relationships, including humankind, and his commitment to the practice of drawing as a means to comprehend the complex processes of the natural world are central, um, uh, are central to the exhibition that we are organizing. Indeed, Bartram's extraordinary drawings, most of which never have been seen by the general public, will form the centerpiece of our show. Scholars whose research ranges across a wide array of fields and disciplines are critical to the development of the project. Since exhibitions are wholly collaborative undertakings, Teresa and I have organized two workshops to help us to formulate a vision for the show. Those who have worked on Bartram for much of their careers have entered the conversation thus far. Literary critics, historians of science, intellectual historians, historians of early American culture, art historians and historians of material culture, garden historians, botanists, and zoologists. Historians who study Native American culture, as well as those who study African American culture, will play an especially important role in our project, since Bartram was profoundly influenced by conceptions of the natural world held by enslaved and free people of African descent, with whom he spent time in Philadelphia and on plantations across the South, as well as Native Americans who served as hosts and guides on his travels. Indeed, the exhibition must reflect our current appreciation of the contributions that have been made by Native Americans and people of African descent to an understanding of the cosmos as dynamic and as an interconnected whole. Teresa and I are developing a team of advisors drawn from many communities beyond the academy who will allow us to understand Bartram's work in terms of the wider issues of cultural hybridity and transformation that charged the development of attitudes toward nature in North America during the 18th and early 19th centuries and which continue to inform culture today. As much as William Bartram can be conceived as unusually empathetic toward the thought systems and ways of life of those whose cultures differed from his own, he also must be considered in terms of the imperatives of the empires of which he was a part, both the British empire during his youth and ultimately the United States as it aggressively and sometimes brutally sought to expand its territory across Native American lands, which also were claimed or desired by Britain and other European nations. To convey a sense of how the culture of empire drove Bartram's interests and to illuminate the contending issues that will be evidenced throughout the exhibition, I will sketch a bit of historical background, beginning with a picture of William's father, John, with whom William's own career was bound. John Bartram, who was born in 1699 and died in 1777 during the American Revolution, was the most important purveyor of North American species to Britain and to the rest of Europe for almost half a century. During that time, he stocked his botanic garden with plants gathered on expeditions that he undertook, often with William, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> which extended from Ontario to Florida amongst the farthest travels made by naturalists of European descent across the Northeast and South in the 18th century. 
complicating the ancient European tradition of structuring botanic gardens to demonstrate a taxonomic understanding of the natural world. John laid out his garden to reflect the environments in which he and William had discovered the plants they collected. In an age that celebrated systematic science, the garden became one of the earliest experimental sites for the examination of environmental relationships, helping to lay the groundwork for modern sciences of ecology and conservation. John built a network of contacts across North America, Britain, and continental Europe, including the philosopher, inventor, and revolutionary statesman, Benjamin Franklin, with whom he established the first iteration of the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia in the 1730s, the physician and founder of the British Museum, Sir Hans Sloan, whose collections he augmented, and the renowned systematist naturalist, Carl Linnaeus, with whom he worked to identify North American species. John's post as botanist to King George III was secured for him by Peter Collinson, a London cloth merchant, broker for transglobal exchange of naturalia, and fellow of the Royal Society. For many years, Collinson served as the most active promoter of Bartram's interests, disseminating John's shipments to the great gardens, menageries, and cabinets of curiosity in Britain and across the continent, indeed in a, across the world, and amplifying his transglobal contacts. Among these was the English naturalist, Mark Catesby, who between 1729, <clears throat> excuse me, and 1743, published the first major illustrated natural history of the British colonies of North America. John Bartram contributed specimens to Catesby's appendix. Um, and you see here on the upper left, um, two of the images that Catesby created so creatively from John's specimens. Um, and he, John, and William both were deeply influenced by Catesby's innovative view of the natural world as an integrated system. And you see Catesby's extraordinary um, print from the natural history of the black snake and arm on the left, and the young William Bartram's um, conversation piece with that work um, in a drawing that he sent um, to Peter Collinson in the 1760s. Beginning just a few years before that, in the 1750s, Peter Collinson brought attention to William's own remarkable drawings, executed to enhance his father's consignments of seeds and living and preserved specimens of flora and fauna for British and continental patrons who might never see the natural productions of North America in their natural habitats. In fact, William was the first naturalist of European descent born in the British colonies of North America to portray nature extensively. Following his father's interest in an environmental understanding of the natural world, he strove to communicate his dynamic conception of living plants and animals to distant correspondence by combining specimens with drawings and written descriptions. In so doing, he portrayed with force and clarity an integrated vision of nature that European naturalists were beginning to recognize as a counterpoint to an abstract taxonomic hierarchy of species formulating, formulated according to the ancient precedent of the great chain of being. From 1773 to 77, with support from the London physician, John Fothergill, William retraced and extended the Southern travels he had made with his father. On this venture, venture, he not only assembled a collection of seeds and plants and preserved specimens and produced drawings that were shared among major scientific and artistic circles in Britain, but he wrote the journals that would serve as the basis for his book entitled Travels Through North America, um, South Carolina, Georgia, and East and West Florida. This magnum opus first published in Philadelphia in 1791, and then in multiple editions in Britain and on the continent, would influence the revolutionary view of nature espoused by romantic poets, including William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, as well as 19th century European and American writers um, on the natural world, such as Alexander von Humboldt, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau. 
Bartram's travels, all 527 pages of it, remains a classic text in the history of nature writing today. John Bartram died soon after William returned from his southern sojourn, and William resettled at the home that his father had built on the Schuylkill. He helped his brother John Jr. to run the family's garden, and using the site and collections as an informal academy, he came to serve as the potter familias of the next generations of naturalists who would help to define the course of American science. In the 1780s, he began to collaborate with Benjamin Smith Barton, providing drawings to illustrate Barton's textbook, The Elements of Botany, and many other of Barton's publications. William also played a central role in mentoring Alexander Wilson, the author um, and illustrator of the first major book on American birds to be published in the United States, entitled The American Ornithology. He worked closely with the painter, naturalist, and museum director, Charles Wilson Peale, and he nurtured the talents of many of his own relatives, such as his niece, Anna Bartram Carr, who would come to run the garden in partnership with her husband, and his grandnephew, the entomologist, Thomas Say. The ornithological artist, John James Audubon, also relied on Bartram's travels for his own vision of the natural world as a complex environmental system. John and William Bartram's pioneering contributions to the transatlantic network of plant exchange fundamentally transformed the composition and appearance of the scientific and ornamental landscape being shaped by British and continental gardeners, nurserymen, merchants, gentry, and aristocrats, as well as by wealthy colonial American merchants and planters associated with enlightenment science and the culture of empire. Along with um, the Bartram's own garden, these deeply connected cultivated spaces will lie at the heart of the exhibition and will be represented by specimens, botanical drawings, paintings and prints, garden plans, rare books and manuscripts, and garden tools, all attesting to the Bartram's profound impact on the history of gardens and landscapes. A range of such objects associated with the Barton, Bartram's and more will illustrate the material, intellectual, political, and economic complexity of 18th century natural history in the transatlantic world, and I should say really transnational world. The exhibition will show that the Bartrams were central forces shaping the artistic and scientific cultures of Europe and North America, both before and after the revolution. In shedding light on the early development of ecology and conservation, their histories invite reflection on the dire issues that we face in our own time, caused in part by the global redistribution of plant and animal species through human migration and trade, as well as em expanding empires. It is paradoxical that the Bartrams not only took part actively in these processes, but through their early understanding of environmental relationships, help to form the intellectual tools necessary to address such challenges in our world today. Because of their roles in the transatlantic communities of knowledge and their insights into the complex relations between human beings and the natural world, the Bartram's lives and work provide a valuable lens on the human ecosystems that characterize colonial America and the early Republic, as well as an understanding of the attitudes toward nature in the period. John and William often had contradictory responses to their experiences with indigenous peoples and enslaved peoples of African descent. And the ways in which their reactions were shaped must be considered to gain a full sense of William himself. William not only spent years in contact with the Creek, Seminole, and Cherokee nations on his venture from the Carolinas through Florida to modern day Alabama, but as a young man, he lived on his uncle's plantation in Cape Fear, North Carolina, where he learned about the natural world from the enslaved people, unnamed people today, um, who labored there. In 1766, he asked his father to purchase six men and women of African descent to work for him as slaves on a rice and indigo plantation that he attempted to establish on an estuary of the St. John's River in Florida, but which was in every way disastrous and failed in less than a year. 
Ultimately, William would become a vocal abolitionist along with other members of his Quaker family in Philadelphia. But he cannot be exonerated for this reprehensible aspect of his life. And it must be taken into account in our exhibition. Indeed, our project will serve as a case study examining the diverse systems of knowledge about nature and culture, both virtuous and malevolent, that converged and collided in this period, resulting in new conceptions of an interconnected, ever shifting, and not entirely benevolent cosmos. While the exhibition will bring together a wide range of objects exemplifying the vibrant, beautiful, and often contentious visual and material culture of natural history produced by William and Bartram and others of European descent in the 18th and early 19th centuries. It also will highlight rare artifacts from the period that reflect the natural knowledge of Native Americans and enslaved people of African descent with whom William was familiar. Some of these precious objects, indeed many of them, will not be able to be shown. But contemporary Native American artists and artists of African descent will be invited to address the themes explored through the exhibition, indeed will help us to define those themes, allowing the voices of those whose lands were confiscated, bodies violated, and cultures disrupted through the larger story of empire in which William Bartram participated. And it will allow those voices to be heard, as well as ensuring that alternative narratives, which challenge the notion of environmental thought as wholly European, um, as rather a wholly European construct, can have full play. We are conscious of how complex a challenge this will be, given the very institutions which possess the objects to be lent to the exhibition and presumably the venues at which the, action will, the exhibition will be displayed result themselves from the history of empire. We hope, however, that the discussions in which we will continue to be engaged will help us to discipline this, our approach and to hone a valuable and thought-provoking project. Thank you. I am delighted to welcome Teresa O'Malley to the screen now, who will speak next in our presentation. Teresa. So I will talk about our approach to this project of an exhibition that reflects this cross-disciplinary state of the field, and we hope pushes forward this rich history toward new scholarship and an understanding of the Bartrams and their world. Over the years we have worked together, we return repeatedly to the theme of the garden for such an exhibition as one way of conceptualizing our shared interest. The garden, whether real or imagined, functions very much like a William's body of writings and sketches. As Joel Fry, the historian has said, it is a pool of shared culture. There have been a thousand aphorisms for the garden. I particularly like what the philosopher Michel Foucault said, quote, the garden is the smallest part of the world and the whole world at the same time, end quote. How perfect a way to think about the Bartram's garden and their view of the landscape they inhabited. Their garden on the Schuylkill River and others like it in their transatlantic network were living laboratories for experiments in naturalizing plants, studios for artistic illustration, depots for the collection and distribution of plants and seeds, a nexus for an international community of natural philosophers, gardeners, artists, and students. While our project focuses on William Bartram, attention is paid to a range of individuals who collected, exchanged, chronicled, and recorded data. They had an ecological impact on one another that parallels the interrelationships of all organisms and their environments. The theme of the garden, both real and metaphorical, can serve us broadly. The historian Charlotte Porter referred to the territories the Bartrams explored such as Florida, which you see here on the right, as William's literary garden. This is where he spent so much time exploring, collecting, and about which he wrote so meaningfully. We know well how the Bartrams left the proverbial garden wall and saw all the world as a garden. The artist naturalist John James Audubon wrote in 1832, here I am in the Floridas, which from my childhood I have consecrated in my 
imagination as the garden of the United States. Mr. Bartram was the first to call this a garden, but he is to be forgiven. He was an enthusiastic botanist and rare plants in the eyes of such a man convert a wilderness at once into a garden." End quote. There is much to unpack in this statement, including the notion of wilderness. The American landscape that the Bartrams experienced had already been shaped for years by indigenous and colonial peoples, animals, and the movement of plants, gardened, if you will, long before the Bartrams arrived. So the garden as a theme, and as we interpret it, embodies the space that can be at once closed, delimited, a hortus conclusus, may be private, as well as the seeming infinite territory or terra incognita, to some a shared communal space to others. Can you advance my, there we go. The historian Charlotte Porter referred to the territories, the Bartrams, I'm sorry, uh, Charles Wilson Peeled, frustrated by the limitation of his museum to display botanical sciences, turned to making his own Fermorne and with his son Rubens, who was a botanist at Belfield, his garden you see on the left outside of Philadelphia. In 1812, he wrote to President Thomas Jefferson, who was a notable gardener himself with the advice, your garden must be a museum to you. Well, for our project, these words must be inverted. The museum must be a garden to us. But how does a museum do justice to the inexhaustible theme of the garden within its four walls? The challenge we have is to express the scales of a garden, microcosm and macrocosm at the same time. The object will range, of course, as Amy has shown you, by medium, function, and association. And I'm just showing you two more examples of related artifacts, a plate from the Hortus consonianus uh, and a dried specimen made by Bartram himself and sent to Lord Robert Peter for his wilderness garden in England. In a previous workshop, Thomas Halleck, a literary historian, uh, who has written a great deal about William Bartram's travels, asked us, how are you going to display Bartram's words, his description of plants, animals, or emotions, all those things that we admire so much in the travels, the travels which you see here. So this verbal dimension is indispensable to the project, but how is it captured in a gallery? As historians of art, science, and culture, we all know too well that the study of the garden can be complicated and unwieldy. The fundamental concepts of movement in space, change over time, and the relationship of parts to whole are key to understanding the making, meaning, or legacy of any garden. But the challenge to exhibit the history of gardens has been attempted more and more frequently as environmental and plant humanities grow, both in the Academy and among general audiences. I'm thinking of the 400th anniversary ex exhibition of the French designer Le Notre at Versailles, which for which grand scale drawings from all over France were found and assembled for the very first time, dispelling the prevailing notion that Le Notre did not leave plans. They filled the walls or Conrad Gessner's 500th anniversary, which was celebrated in Bern with related shows in all the botanic gardens throughout Switzerland. There was the Garden der Welt exhibition in Zurich, in fact, in an underground museum, yet it was fully engaging because of its multimedia experience. And the superb Jardin uh, Garden, the Jardin exhibition, which was held at the Grand Palais in Paris, also, the Metropolitan Museum recently had two concurrent garden shows. Some have had amazing new technology, such as olfactory installations to recapture the sense of smell 
And of course, the virtual reality headsets for an immersive experience and sense of movement and changing views, so vital to garden experience. We are thinking about all kinds of technology that could be used appropriately to approximate the experience of the Barchans, both in their Philadelphia garden and in their explorations. To my mind, the most successful of these exhibitions have overcome the challenges by exploring the long established shared goals of the garden and the museum, the pursuit of knowledge, beauty, and pleasure. We have many urgent concerns also to address, acknowledging all the historic figures in these stories, the ecological implications, and the concerns of environmental degradation wrought by humans and the consequence of their interaction, and the recognition and examination of previously neglected topics that are related to the exploitation of nature and people in the pursuit of political and capitalistic goals. So what then do we exhibit from the metaphorical or real, the cultivated or uncultivated gardens of the past to tell these stories? What are the objects that represent most poignantly the achievements, failures, products, losses of the Bartrams and their world? How best to present the material history of place, the writings, artifacts, works of art, tools of labor, specimens, and everything else. What objects, we ask, we will address the historical and critical questions while reaching new audiences. In our workshops, we ask participants to bring to the table one object they felt should be in the exhibition. Of course, no one could just bring one object. Their ideas were quite different each reflecting this disciplinary perspective from which they came. We told them about John Evelyn, the 17th century English writer who wrote the great work Elysium Britannicum. And in that he wrote that the garden is the only art form that involves all five senses, sight, smell, touch, taste, and hearing. And asked them, how does a museum exhibition provide that? Participants picked quickly up on Evelyn's definition of the garden as they were concerned with capturing the experiential sensory quality of Bartram's world. So let me show you just a few of those examples. For the sense of smell, I show you two herbaceous plants, which William collected, Cleome and Evening Primrose. In a series of instructions Bartram received from London prior to his explorations in the American Southwest, he was directed to find, quote, the useful, the beautiful, the singular, or the fra fragrant. These are the most material to us. This is what he was told. Both of these plants were distinguished by William, he wrote, for their scent. And Cleome Giandra is particularly interesting here because it was brought to North America by enslaved Africans. And as you can see from the uh, image I show, which is from the 1640s, it was already known in Italy. So when William collected it, it had already been under cultivation. For the sensory experience of smell, one scholar suggested burning candle wax myrtle, Morella serifera, in the exhibit being a, one of the plants that Bartram collected and a very important economic plant. Not that most museums would allow this to happen, but it was a good idea. Bartram learned about it probably from the Choctaw as the Europeans called the indigenous people in the region where he found it. They used it for medicinal purposes and colonists made spicy aromatic candles out of it. The sense of sound. One literary scholar said about Bartram's book, The Travels, that not only, in a, not only did it offer a vivid visual description, it provided a virtual soundtrack through its rich account of bird song, and in this case, alligators roaring, which William wrote, the earth about them trembles with their thunder. So this must be captured somehow as well. And in addition to the environmental sounds, Bartram's own flute on display might give a sense of the musical and cultural world in which that family lived. 
For touch, I'm showing you the carnivorous Venus flytrap or sensitive plant, a plant that closes its leaves upon being touched by an insect. The tactility of sand, soil, fossils, the infinite textures of leaves and bark must be brought into play through interactive displays and perhaps programming that allows for herbarium making and fossil discovery. One of our participants brought to the discussion bags of soil that he had collected from sites all along the Barchan's route. For taste, well, Bartram's writings, uh, and I'm showing you an example here from his commonplace book, which was a posthumously bound group of his notebooks. This one shows uh, the illustration he made of making a bee box. So his writings contain rich evidence of foodways through recipes, accounts of indigenous and colonial cultivation, and of course, medicinal uses. William's brother, Mo brothers, Moses and Isaac Bartram, were apothecaries and deeply involved in colonial and early medical worlds. William described also food, Kante. This was a Creek Indian food prepared from Smilax root. When sweetened with honey, he said, it becomes a beautiful, delicious jelly, very nourishing and wholesome. The fifth sense, vision, in, in addition to any living plants that might be displayed in a related garden planting for the exhibitions, um, is experience, of course, the amazing drawings and reproductive prints, illustrated books and maps that you've been sampling. And I hope you see from what Amy has shown you of William's work, that it is visually very, very compelling. And all this will be a major aspect of the exhibition. So beyond the sensory, objects proposed by the workshop group fell into different categories of the historical, the artistic, cultural, and, of, and the scientific. Joel Fry offered this example of a dispatch box recently discovered, which was probably what was used to send documents between the crown in England and John Bartram, who was the king's botanist. The insignia of George III is still visible. It also serves to give a profound sense of the importance of the Bartram's work to the European world. This wooden box is important too because it reminds us of the, of the significance of the economics of natural history, the woods, dye stuffs, oils, and so many more products wrought from plant utilization. The artistic or cultural objects are so well represented by all the Williams drawings, but here is a silhouette, an unusual object made probably by um, Mr. Uh, Moses Williams, who was the formerly enslaved mixed race artist who worked in, Char in Charles Wilson Peale's museum. He was renowned in his time for his, pr his profile paper cutouts of which he made thousands. Art historian, Gwendolyn Shaw tells us that Moses Williams was often dressed up as a Native American and displayed along with the natural area of the museum. This silhouette is also of particular interest because it's probably of Anna Bartram Carr, the woman who assumed the role of running Bartram's garden and nursery after her uncle William's death. This kind of object tells many stories of people, ideology, and the changing world of art and natural history in that period. Ah. Somehow lost my last one. And finally, the scientific object but as you can see here from this spread of the Frank Linnea Altamaha, it really it crosses all the different categories. This was a plant that was found 
at the Altamaha River Gorge in 1765. It was collected in 1773, and it's now cultivated around the world. But in 1790, it was the last seen in the wild. The Franklinia Altamaha is now considered extinct in the wild. It's an endemic genus of one species. But because we have this dried specimen, new techniques such as genome sequencing can be used to provide a window into the past and the future. An object of scientific study also allows the story of loss and destruction to the national, natural environment that the Bartrams witnessed. Our project considers cases of living plants that depend upon the evidence of works on paper, dried specimen, published images, and memorable writings, which themselves all moved across land and water in their own time. In closing, I will add that there is another characteristic the museum exhibit and the garden share. At last, they are both ephemeral. We will certainly have a catalog that crisscrosses conventional disciplinary boundaries and we hope will remain a substantial and enduring contribution after the exhibition is spent. Thank you very much. <laughs>